Hi, dear students. So today I will be conducting IGCSE seminar 2021, 1123 O level English language. So I'll be covering both paper one as well as paper two. So basically, uh, there are two sections covered in paper one, namely directed writing and composition. So before I explain in detail, perhaps I would like to share with you some, um, some of the assessment details. So basically, um, the students are required to answer paper one uh, within one hour and 30 minutes and 30 marks given for directed writing and another 30 marks given for composition. So in total, um, 60 marks for this external assessment. And then we will be converting the 60 marks to 50% um, and another 50% will come from paper two, okay? So basically uh, talking about directed writing, Okay, uh, it is all about um, the candidates. Uh, I mean, it's all about require. I mean, it's all about getting the candidates to write um, a letter, a speech, a report, or even an article. So, out of these four types of uh, writing, only one type of writing will be tested. So, when it comes to letter, I would say it could be a formal letter or an informal letter. So uh, the, the kind of scenarios or the kind of situations given uh, in order to answer any one of this uh, type of writing in direct writing uh, will be focuses on um, scenarios related to world of study, work, or even community. For an example, um, let's say that this task focuses on um, an informal letter written by, uh, by a student to, uh, to a friend, um, you know, uh, discussing about an important event that happened in school. So that is definitely something related to world of study and community. Now, let's say that if the candidate has been asked to write um, a speech to be delivered um, in a school assembly about the importance of road safety example. So the topic is somehow related to society and community. So uh, whatever task or whatever scenario that uh, that will be given to the students will somehow relate it to scenarios um, related to study, work, or in fact, the community. So um, uh, it's not going to be a very lengthy response whereby students are required to write about 200 to 30, uh, sorry, 200 to 300 words. Uh, and it could be to inform or even to persuade. So um, the candidate has to determine whether the purpose of of the writing is to inform or to persuade based on the task given. And um, total 30 marks. And if we look at how do we divide or how do we distribute this 30 marks? So 50 marks will be given for task fulfillment, solely focusing on content. That means um, in answering this directed writing question, uh, the candidate will need to answer um, or will need to respond to three bullet points. That means these are the three main ideas that they have to put in their writing. So in case if the candidate failed to fulfill uh, or failed to answer um, the three bullet points given, fail to extend uh, uh, supporting details or fail to fulfill the three bullet points, therefore marks would definitely be affected for uh, task fulfillment. So remember that 15 marks given for task fulfillment, that means we are focusing on the content. And um, another 15 marks for language accuracy. Later, I'll be sharing with you what are the um, marking criteria or what are the aspects of language that we are going to consider in order to give this 15 marks um, to the students, okay? So um, let me share with you how to get this 15 marks for task fulfillment. So remember that in the question, you will be given some sort of instructions and then uh, this instruction uh, comes with three bullet points. So three bullet points. So that means these should be like the 
like the body paragraphs uh, for the essay, that means uh, for the letter or for the speech, for the article, or even for the report. So by answering the three bullet points, the candidates are somehow answering or fulfilling the instruction given. Therefore, students can definitely get marks for task fulfillment. Okay, so when the students follow the instruction given by the examiner, they are actually completing the task fulfillment and that's how do they score 15 marks. Okay, and then um, so um, it's not only about just answering the three bullet points, but it is also very crucial for the candidate to show um, a proper understanding of the purpose. That means what is the aim, what is the goal of, uh, of their writing, whether they are providing relevant information or whether they are expressing themselves in detail um, and how they could basically show uh, the connection between the three bullet points um, um, with the point extension, um, which are uh, somehow relevant to the topic. Okay, so all these are very crucial in order to get 15 marks for task fulfillment. So candidates need to uh, constantly have that clear awareness of the situation and the audience. So it's, it is also part of task fulfillment, whether you are writing um, the letter or whether you are writing the speech or report or article to a particular group of audience and whether the style, the tone, the register are uh, maintained throughout, um, throughout uh, the writing. Okay, now, so talking about language now, so how, uh, how do we give marks? How do we give this 15 marks for language? Okay, so uh, talking about the uh, language accuracy, okay, obviously the examiners will judge how the candidates basically um, communicate their ideas uh, through their language, okay? Therefore, uh, a few uh, criteria or a few um, um, language elements will definitely be uh, assessed here. Okay, so um, number one, obviously, uh, the the type of sentences used by um, by the candidate. That means whether uh, the candidate ended up using simple sentences throughout the writing, which will ended up. Um, uh, which will end up with a very boring response, okay? Or it even show that the students are not creative enough to um, uh, to to vary different types of sentences or to show um, a coherence and unity in their writing. Therefore, um, varying sentence structure, simple, compound, complex, and even compound complex sentences in writing will help the uh, candidates to gain mark uh, for language. Okay, now apart from uh, types of sentences, this is another uh, aspect of language tenses. So I'm pretty sure that students, especially uh, students who are doing English as a second language, that means uh, second language English uh, speakers or the third language English speakers uh, often uh, find uh, quite difficult to understand uh, the formation of verb tense in different situations. So um, make sure that uh, appropriate tenses and work forms must be uh, largely correct in the student's response. So uh, it's very crucial to express an actual uh, time frame, time reference. Therefore, uh, it's it is very paramount to uh, to use an accurate form, work form. Okay. So yeah. Uh, the next aspect of language would definitely be vocabulary. That means uh, we will see uh, the variety in the student's choice of words um, in order to um, convey the, the, the writing uh, clearly to the reader. In, in this case, we are talking about the examiner. Okay, so it means that your language um, must be mature. That means uh, you have to use a, a strong vocabulary, sophisticated uh, language. Okay, so instead of uh, instead of mentioning bad, like how bad is bad, I mention uh, instead of mentioning good, how good is good. So uh, avoid weakness. Perhaps choose a specific words which can help you to convey your ideas um, effectively. Okay, so uh, apart from vocabulary, another language aspect which help 
uh, which will help you to gain that 15 marks would definitely spelling. So please make sure that your spelling is correct, your punctuation mark is correct, and you have to vary the transitional words to show the link between one idea to the other idea. So these are some examples of transitional, uh, transitional words. Okay, so next I'm going to go through some formats for all level English directed writing tasks, a very quick one. So um, just pay attention to different text types and uh, uh, the, 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 the formats of uh, or the layout that you have to um, a structure, okay? Um, so basically, remember that um, uh, the first thing is to follow the instructions given in the question about the format and always ignore everything else that anyone has told you about the format. So just a focus on what your teachers teach you. So do not simply uh, get, um, you know, information from, I mean, uh, invalid information and you ended up producing incorrect format for your uh, directed writing. So this is a formal letter. Okay, so um, if the question includes the instruction, start your letter, dear sir, then you do not need to write the addresses. Generally, we don't really have addresses unless if, if uh, address is needed uh, uh, or mentioned in the instruction instruction, then you may include, okay? So um, you just straight away start with the salutation. And then, so this is the salutation. That means, you know, you, you, you say, dear sir or dear madam, or you can also use a specific name of the recipient if that is required or that is given in the question. And then this is the body of the letter. So you can write the content. So this will eventually be your three bullet points. And then always make sure that keep your left margin for a formal letter. That means you put your sincerely, yours faithfully, your truly, yours truly. But remember that if you address the person with his or her name, therefore you mention your sincerely. For an example, if you say, dear Mr. Sam, then you use your sincerely. But in case if you are not addressing the recipients using his or her name, like dear sir, dear madam, therefore you use yours faithfully. So this is like the business English language, okay? Like for an example, dear sir, dear madam, therefore you use yours faithfully. So I strongly suggest students to focus on this too. So addressing uh, 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 the recipient using his or her name, yours sincerely. If you're giving a general um, salutation, you're addressing the person using uh, a very general acknowledgement, therefore yours faithfully. So you can always put your signature here and then you can write your full name here. Okay, so if you have a specific post, therefore you tend to write a post, but this is again, depends on the question. So informal letter, in fact, um, simpler compared to formal letter. So it's going to be quite spontaneous, quite casual. But remember, even though it's an informal letter, colloquialism is something that we don't really encourage in academic English. And that means when you are answering uh, for examination purpose, therefore we don't really encourage you to use um, slang, colloquialism. Therefore you are required to use standard English at all the time, okay? So remember, dear uncle, dear Ali, depends on the question, then you write the content, and then you maintain your right margin. Love, best regards, best, best wishes, um, yours, um, with love. So you can just make it as casual as possible. So you can just put a signature. Perhaps you do not need to even um, write your full name because you're writing it to someone that you know, perhaps a family member or a friend Therefore, a casual closure would sufficient for informal letter. So in case if you've been asked to write a report, okay, so um, it's very straightforward. So there are basically two types so of, of, of layout. The first layout is, um, let's say in the recent, Okay, let's say the format has been given in the exam question. That means you just need to follow the one that is given in the question paper. That means uh, generally it will ask you to start with to the principal. So you write the body of the report and then you put your signature here. You can write your full name or you can even put like a date because this is a formal report. Okay, but let's say if there is no instructions about the format given in the question. Therefore, you can start with the to, who, uh, from, who, and then the subject the date 
may be. That means, and after this, you do not need to include any personal reference because you already put it before you even start writing the report. So you look at the question and then you decide which format or which layout that you can choose. Okay. Now, next one is newspaper report. So when it comes to newspaper report or even a magazine article, generally you see a headline. So sometimes the headline will be given in the question or you tend to create your own headline uh, based on the content. So, um, and you have a byline here. So what is a byline? Byline is, um, is the name of the reporter or the name of the person who has written the article or the report. So you can just write your name, for an example, horrific accident claims five lives on Karangi Road by Sarah, for an example. And then you have to straight away write your um, article or your newspaper report. Now, when it comes to speech, always remember that it, this is, um, this is a, a spoken register, therefore, um, of course, you are writing something that you will be uh, delivering orally. Therefore, you need to have a, a particular audience uh, reference before you start giving the speech. That means you just need to acknowledge the audience, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, or the teachers, or members on the floor, depends on the task given, okay? And then you write the speech and then finally you say, Thank you. Okay, clear? So I have an example of informal letter here, a sample informal letter question. So this is a sample question. You need to borrow something from a friend for a special purpose. Write a letter to your friend asking that if you can borrow this item, you should include the following. So these are the three bullet points, what you need to borrow and how far long, how long will you need for it, why you need it and how you will you use it and offer to do something for them in written. So you're supposed to cover all the three bullet points and then you should make your letter very friendly and polite and start with a dear friend. So the salutation is given in the question itself. So first of all, you have to understand that informal letters are personal letters. Therefore, um, you're writing it to a family member or a friend that means it's definitely a personal audience. Therefore, uh, you can have some sort of casual tone, informal tone um, uh, that, I mean, to someone with whom you share a friendly relation. So um, it's not to someone who you, I mean, whom you share a professional or even business related relation. So you can make it slightly casual, but remember to use standard English. So tone of your writing can be slightly casual, like what I mentioned, okay? And then um, like what I mentioned just now, okay? I think I shared with you uh, the layout of an informal letter, okay? So it's similar to this, but it's just that remember that the set the salutation um, left and side, and then the closure part where you will be signing off. I mean, the part where you will be saying bye to your uh, relative or your friend, you have to put it on the right hand side. So remember, right margin for you to end the letter, and you use a left margin uh, when you're introducing the letter. Okay, so remember to develop all the required points in detail in order to get 15 marks for task fulfillment. Okay, and then the tone and register must be completely appropriate. Okay, and then um, it can be spontaneous because you are communicating with someone that you know personally, but remember to use academic English, that means to use standard English. Okay, so choose um, uh, right words okay, in order to maintain uh, you know, a, a simple uh, language instead of having sophisticated language, which may end up changing your informal or slightly informal tone into a formal writing. Okay, now, so how can you maintain um, a, a language uh, or uh, the register, the tone of your writing, um, maintaining the, the formality of the writing, uh, whether you want to fix to um, formal or informal, there are a few ways. And one of the ways is definitely by selecting an appropriate vocabulary. Can you see this? So these are some of the examples of informal words. That means when you tend to choose words like this, the one that is in green, so um, the entire style of your writing 
may not really fit with the task given to you in the question. So if you're writing uh, an informal letter, therefore you can obviously include uh, contractions. That means you do not need to say I am. You can just say I'm. You do not need to say can't. You can say, uh, sorry, cannot. You can say can't. That means you're allowed to use contractions. You're allowed to use phrasal verbs and you're allowed to use um, simple um, vocabulary like this. Okay, and then this is an example, okay, an example of um, uh, an informal writing, okay, and then um, uh, there, are quite, there are some strength uh, could be found in this sample. So basically three content points have been addressed. The format is on the sample is correct. It's not really correct because this closure is supposed to be on the right hand side here. So like your loving friend, Adam Rizvi is supposed to be here. So one thing that I do really, um, I'm not very happy with the, with, the, with the answer is that the layout of, of, of the response. So um, I always suggest students to have three complete body paragraphs uh, to help the examiner. That means you're just like um, helping the examiner to see your points clearly. That means you have three bullet points, then you can have three body paragraphs. Perhaps you can have a little introduction and a conclusion so you can come up with an excellent structure. Okay, now um, later you guys can um, read this, okay, um, uh, and then you can try to relate to some of the strength and the limitations um, of this response, but I am um, also um, going to touch on this part here, okay, um, perhaps I will go um, uh, in detail on writing formal letter, perhaps I'll be reading for you a sample formal letter. Okay, so this is um, the task. Okay, you return to your house one day to find it has been broken into and many of your possessions have been stolen. So you decide to write a letter to the police to report the robbery. Write your letter. You must include the following. So at what time and for how long you were away from the house when the robbery took place, detailed information about the most valuable items taken and any clues you have noticed and how you think the police might be able to catch the thief. So these are the three ideas that you have to incorporate. You're supposed to start your letter with dear sirs and then make sure that your letter is informative and helpful. See, um, do not um, uh, do not um, mis try not to misunderstand the question because sometimes by you misunderstanding the question, instead of giving an informative piece of response, you ended up giving a narration because it involves a sequence of events. So I, I just do not want you to, um, you know, change the content of an informative letter into a narrative like you're telling or you're narrating a story. So that is definitely going um, to go slightly out of the um, task fulfillment um, criteria. Okay, so this is an example of a very good uh, response. Perhaps I would like to read this response here. Okay, so dear sis, my name is, let's say, Sarah. I'm writing to report a robbery that took place on 20th September. On the day in question, I was shopping in the market between, so that means on the day um, you can go to the question and then you can come up with your own date, okay? I was shopping in the market between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. When I returned to my house, I found out that the door was broken and the furniture inside was mostly missing and the remaining untidy. I immediately checked the entire house and unfortunately, I found out that some valuable items were long gone. I pondered over for some time and I found out that the items that were stolen included a diamond uh, bracelet and a silver watch. The silver watch is made up of pure 9 to 5 silver and the diameter of the watch is 2 cm with Roman numerals making the numbers. Now the bracelet is simple white gold bangle and it has diamonds engraved as its perimeters. Furthermore, I noticed some fingerprints on my bedroom mirror. A piece of red cloth, fairly untidy, caught in the door handle was also found indicating that the thieves were in a hurry. Moreover, there were footprints in my garden as well. I believe that you might be able to trace the robbers by viewing the cameras in the town. You may also visit the nearby jewelry shops to find out whether the bracelet is sold or not. 
to conclude, I hope that you can quickly solve the robbery and locate my belongings. I'll help you in any way I can. You can contact me on my number and even can pay a visit to the address that is mentioned at the back of the envelope this letter came with. So, uh, of course, I could see some uh, punctuation errors here and there, uh, but it doesn't really make the language sounds awful. Basically, it's definitely a great um, response given for both language uh, fulfillment, I mean, for the language accuracy and task fulfillment. So, even though the address and the phone number are something that not really requested uh, or something that not really mentioned in the task fulfillment but i i could see the rationale behind uh, giving the address and the phone number especially for this this sort of uh, scenario so this is definitely an added advantage for the candidate okay great so um, yes you may look at the examiner's response so i would say it's a perfect sample to discuss how to attempt o level formal letter okay so basically um uh, it's not really a narrative a sort of writing it's basically um uh, informative like what required in the in the in the in the in the question itself in the instruction itself so um, basically, the task fulfillment is um, uh, related to the purpose, audience, and the situation. Okay, mm -hmm. so the opening is good, the closure is good, the tone, the register, everything is basically excellently done. And in fact, the tone um, of the response is very polite and informative, which is definitely uh, a good thing done by the uh, by the candidate. Okay, and. Um, and uh, this is another example, so I'm not going to read this, perhaps by looking at the entire layout, perhaps you know there's something wrong with this um, in, with this formal letter, like for an example, providing, I mean, the recipient address here, something that we don't really have in, uh, you know, um, I mean, there's something not really there um, uh, following IGCSE, sorry, uh, following um, O level 1123 format. So, this is something that we don't really ask students to do, like, uh, like adding a title or a subheadings. So, uh, perhaps, um, you know, the entire layout doesn't really look suitable, doesn't really relate to um, O level 1123 format requirement. Okay, so this is the response from the teacher. So I'm pretty sure that you guys have uh, the, the slides with you. So you just need to go through the response from the teacher in order to see what are the limitations and strength of the second sample. Okay, so next I'm going to go to um, uh, some conventions of writing a speech. Okay, so we are done with a formal letter, informal letter. I'm going to continue with conventions of writing a speech. Okay, so Generally, you welcome the audience, you introduce yourself. So your tone and the language depends on the context, obviously. Okay, so you use you tone to involve the audience. You can obviously include humor, and then you can have um, some little pauses uh, of gestures and fillers. Uh, but this is not really uh, going to make a very big impact. So even without this, I'm pretty sure that your speech is still good. Okay, so obviously you can um, refer to certain facts and statistics if you're making a persuasive speech. Okay, and then vary your sentence structure, and then you can obviously include some um, famous quotes, okay, like you can express strong opinion, expressing with logical reasoning, you can use some figurative language, you can include some rhetorical question, emotive language, vivid language, and obviously you are going to thank the audience at the end of the speech, okay. So um, this is an example of a speech question. Okay, so your best friend is a popular person at school and is very successful both inside and outside the classroom. Your friend is leaving the school to move overseas. Now your teacher, Mr. Johnson, asks you to make a speech to your classmates on the last day of them of the term, wishing your friend goodbye and good luck. So write your speech in and you must include the following. So the name of your friend and where your friend is going, why your friend is moving, and what you and your classmates will miss about your friend. 
Okay, so um, again, I'm sharing with you the task fulfillment. So how to get a highest band for task fulfillment. So make sure that you have a very good understanding of the purpose, clear awareness of the specified situation. The text type is entirely appropriate and all required points developed in detail, uh, fully amplified and well organized. Okay, and then given information basically well used to justify personal opinion and then the tone and register must be entirely appropriate. And how to get highest band for language like what I mentioned just now you have to vary the sentence structure you have to use accurate word form um, make sure that you have variety of vocabulary accurate punctuation spelling and then make sure that you have uh, created a cohere a cohe I mean um, uh, you have uh, created a response which is uh, or which has unity and also coherent okay so this is a simple answer Okay, so this is a sample answer. Uh, Mr. Johnson and friends, let me begin my speech with my sincere gratitude to all of you for your presence. However, I feel really unhappy to tell you that a very well-known figure of our school is leaving us this Friday. Adam, do you know him? Well, who does not? Mr. Johnson and all my respected um, fellows. Adam is amidst these last days, days which he is spending with us. He will be leaving us this Friday for Manchester, England. Anyways, I know none of us should actually be sad for Adam moving overseas. It will be just a physical day-to-day -day connection that would be missing, but we all will be virtually connected way too strong. Adam would be living in the strong long distance room friendship. So can you see that how well the first bullet point has been explained, the name of the friend and where your friend is going. I don't want to continue. Perhaps the first introduction um, can give you a little idea about how to answer um, the question. So these are some of the comments on the sample. You have the slides with you. Perhaps you can go through the comments. Okay. Now I'm going to continue with paper two and then um, section two, composition. So. Um, Again, this composition section um, gives you about 30 marks, and then you will be given with five uh, topics. And one that so one, de one descriptive topic, two argumentative topics, and two narrative topics. And you are required to choose only one out of these five essay titles. And um, it's going to be 300 to 500 words of response, words of essay. Therefore, um, your assessment objectives basically focus on um, writing skills. That means we will look at how well the candidate could express what he or she um, you know, think, uh, feel, and in fact, imagine. So we will look at how the candidates could sequence the facts, ideas, and opinion, the choice of vocabulary, whether the register is appropriate to the audience and context, and obviously the GPSS. What do you mean by GPSS? Grammar, punctuation, spelling, and sentence structure. So um, um, I am going to share with you um, the, the marking rubric. So it's like, um, of course, we don't have a division of mark for content and language, whereby it, the entire thing focuses on writing skill. Therefore, um, we are focusing on language mark, okay, language and also content, but no separate marks given. So it's like a combination of mark for both language and also uh, content. So talking about language, we will look at uh, sentence structure, verb, vocabulary, punctuation, spelling, uh, and paragraphs, uh, um, the, the the unity of the paragraph, like what we have, like what we have it for directed writing, okay. But there's something new that the students need to understand is the appropriateness of the content. Now, of course, you have a few breakdown um, under this appropriateness of content. Now. First of all, we will look at the relevance of the response, whether it's consistently relevant or it is. Um, it, it is not so relevant, okay? Whether the interest is there for us to continue reading your writing, and then whether the tone and register is entirely appropriate uh, for the for the selected uh, genre, or the selected type, whether if it is descriptive, narrative, or even argumentative. So obviously we are going to look at the tone and register, okay? And then um, if the candidate, um, uh, 
uh, ended up writing a descriptive writing, then we will look at how well the candidates have developed the images to have a complex atmosphere, whether the candidates have used, uh, you know, a detailed description, vivid adjectives, strong figurative language, something that could evoke our sensory details. So this is something very important for descriptive writing. And let's say if the students ended up writing an argumentative essay, therefore, obviously we will look at the point of the uh, points uh, of the judgment, whether the points are relevant, whether they are logic, whether they've been supported by um, um, uh, justifiable evidence. So obviously, uh, when it comes to argument, we will be focusing on the convincing strategy or the persuasive um, elements that the writer use in writing the argument. And for narrative, obviously, we will look at the tenses, the characters, we will see whether there are any specific narrative uh, technique being used, for an example, flashback, whether the plot is simple or complicated, sorry, sophisticated. So yes, so this this is how we give mark for appropriateness of the content, but the, it, it comes together. The, the accuracy of the language and the content of the writing definitely come together. Okay, so talking about descriptive writing, see, basically, I, I have uh, gone through the slides with you guys, okay, but it's just that um, I would like to go through this once again, but not in detail seems that a detailed explanation has been given before. I'm just going to go through how to maintain your descriptive writing, um, you know, how to maintain your writing sounds descriptive um, or um, how to say that, um, how to maintain your writing um, in a so descriptive that you can help the audience to imagine every single input that you give in your writing um, and not accidentally um, changing your descriptive writing into narrative writing. Okay, so as usual, you need to use um, a, um, a different imagery. That means words uh, which could evoke your sensory details. Okay, sense of touch, sense of hearing, sense of sight, sense of smell, and sense of taste. Okay, and then I, in fact, shared with you how can you change. Um, um, a common description into a vivid description. For an example, a brown horse. So I ask you to follow a very simple formula here, adjective uh, plus with figurative language. So if you want to really um, uh, evoke the sensory details of the reader, you really want them to imagine. Therefore, do not just give adjectives. You are supposed to combine adjectives with figurative language. For an example, a brown horse, uh, this is descriptive, but it's not a very strong description. But you're adding another figurative language to it, like its coat was as glossy as a conquer. That means you're adding a simile to this adjective. Therefore, you are creating a more sophisticated response. Okay, for an example, um, stepping gingerly, and then as if the earth was hot beneath his hooves. Therefore, um, you know, you are trying to uh, create an adjective with a figurative language. That means you can add with a simile or a metaphor, personification, hyperbole. So as long as your description is not too simple and lame, and uh, um, therefore I would definitely suggest you to include a figurative language. Okay, so um, I, I did ask you to decide on the on the effect that you're aiming for, what sort of atmosphere related to the topic. Let's say if if you are describing the day of the results, so most probably you are creating description related to a tense mood or a mixed emotion. But sometimes certain topics allow you to um, uh, decide on your own atmosphere and mood. For an example, returning home could be tense for some people, excited for some, nervous for some, happy for some. So you decide on the tone, tone uh, sorry, the, the tone, the mood and the atmosphere, and then you finalize the sort of or the type of description that you're going to use uh, to suit with the atmosphere that you have finalized okay so more um uh, description on the uh, on the on the tense uh, sorry on the mood and atmosphere 
okay? And um, always remember the choice of vocabulary will help you to generate understanding of the possible atmosphere as well. For an example, mention is very big, it's grand, so most probably it shows wealth upper class. But when you use the word shack, most probably you are relating to, um, to an atmosphere um, in a very poor community, something which is broken. So most probably the, the atmosphere is quite somber. So yes, so remember to choose a specific uh, vocabulary which could connect or which could create a, some sort of atmosphere. Okay, so these are some examples of touch words, um, sound words, examples of adjectives, and these are some of the adjectives describing personality of, 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 of an individual. Okay, and then um, this is something what we call as rules of three. That means in order to make a subject uh, sounds more descriptive, you tend to add more than one adjective. So I mean, instead of you mentioning race car, you can say a lovely sporty race car. So when you're having more than one adjective in describing a noun, therefore you have to really understand the sequence of the adjective. So I would call this as a royal order of adjective so that you don't mention the color first and then the size later and then the shape uh, before before the, the size. So, so that you don't really uh, create an, uh, an inaccurate um, sequence of adjective. Therefore, try to understand the sequence of adjectives so that you can apply rules of three when you're writing your descriptive writing. So these are some of the examples. Like um, you always start with a general remark, lovely, expensive, beautiful, um, delicious. And then you continue with size, shape, age, color, source, material, qualifier, and also now some examples are given here. Those are rectangular wooden fruit boxes, um, several huge young volleyball players. So yes, so you can obviously use the sequence of adjectives in coming up with a vivid description. Okay, so more vivid verbs, don't just say walk, perhaps you can be a little bit more specific. Um, how did the person run? Or maybe the person scampered, raced, dashed, jogged, like how did the person jumped? Most probably the person, um, you know, somersaulted or plummeted. So choose vivid verbs and you can obviously uh, maximize the use of figurative language. And that means you can use alliteration. Um, that means when you're having a repeated consonant sound, you can use assonance, you can use metaphor, idiom, personification, hyperbole. And in the slides, I have included all the examples of figurative language here. Okay, some example. In fact, you guys have this with you. So you just need to go through this. Examples of assonance, alliteration, um, examples of oxymoron, examples of sound words, okay? Now, um, and try not to be um, uh, vague. That means avoid vagueness and avoid the word very. Therefore, I can advise you to come up with um, words or description which are more specific. Like instead of you, instead of you writing very tasty, so you can say it's mouth-watering, Crumptious. Instead of you telling very traditional, you can even write conventional, established, customary. So make it very, very specific. Okay, so more examples given here. Okay, and then um, this is another important thing when it comes to descriptive writing that you follow some sort of a structure. So we have um, spatial order, and this is suitable to be used when you are describing. Um, uh, I mean, describing a place, for an example, describe um, describe a haunted house. So you go from the entrance and then to the uh, to the to the hall and then to the music room and then towards the end. So let's say that you're describing the hospital. So most probably the entrance, the emergency ward, and then you go to the uh, um, you go to the uh, you know the, the labor ward, and then you go to you know the certain parts of the. That means you describe as you start moving. So this is spatial order. So by having this you somehow tend to follow some sort of um, a structure. That means your response is not everywhere. 
That means you have a specific idea to be covered in each paragraph. Okay. Now, let's say if you are describing events, so most probably you can use this chronological order. Example, uh, let's say if you are describing a birthday party. So what happened before the birthday party, during and after. Let's say that if you are describing a festival or you're talking about perhaps a description about the family dinner during the eve and on the day of celebration. So the description follows according to the time um, time order or the chronological order. Okay. Or if you feel like you do not want to follow spatial or chronological, perhaps you can just follow order of importance. As long as you have different focus in different paragraph, therefore you are trying to apply an appropriate structure in writing a descriptive writing, okay? So this is a very good specimen answer. So when you have time, you can read, you can see that this candidate has used a variety of um, vivid description. That means from the beginning till the end, everything is descriptive, right? And everything, everything is all about description, about the view from the top. So I want you to read this and then try to get some input. OK, and then I would like to also continue with the second type of um, the second type of composition uh, question, which is an argumentative. So talking about argumentative writing, you need to know the differences between argumentative and discursive. So I am again um, showing you the same marking rubric. So this time the focus is we're done with description and now I'm gonna focus on argumentative writing. So remember that your arguments are well-developed, logical and also um, complex. So remember these are some of the tips and Trip, uh, tricks in order to write an argumentative essay. So read the topic carefully, underline the main point of the topic, okay? Decide for or against, okay? Whether you are in favor of the topic or against the topic. Now jot down all the relevant or logical points, okay? So remember no emotional reason should be included. And then um, you can somehow, um, okay? Um, Perhaps you can use this uh, example here. Can you see this is an introduction? Okay. So this is about mobile phone. Okay. So this is an introduction about this current situation of mobile phone. And then this is definitely argument for mobile phone. Okay. So this is basically... Um, focusing on uh, discursive writing. That means you're producing um, arguments for and against. Okay. And then this is the conclusion. So this should be the linkers that you can uh, put. So basically, let's look at the differences between uh, discursive and argumentative compositions. OK, so um, discursive, generally, you have the idea of discuss. That means you are presenting points from both sides. Uh, but when it comes to argumentative, you are agreeing or you're disagreeing on something. So um, they might compel writers to make a stand through the use of absolute terms such as always uh, or definitely. That means you are strongly uh, agree or disagree. So this is definitely an argumentative composition. So talking about discursive, the focus is on explaining one's perspective and thought. But this is more on making a stand and then providing elaboration or proving why your points are correct. And discursive is, is somehow producing a balanced um, argument instead of uh, being uh, um, or uh, instead of like focusing on one side of the argument, uh, that means you're giving a balanced argument and you let the audience to, to decide. But when it comes to argumentative compositions, more points will be given to the part um, where you are agreeing and then you are obviously offering a counter argument and then you're going to rebut the counter argument. Okay, so uh, discursive focus is more on expression and clarity uh, and uh, argumentative is more on being very persuasive and convincing the readers to the writer's point of view. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that this four key ideas will show um, basic differences between discursive and composition. Okay, so you may follow this uh, structure or layout in writing and argumentative writing. That means um, argumentative composition, not discursive composition, yeah? Okay, that means you introduce yourself, sorry, you introduce the topic, you, you give background information, you give thesis statement, that means your stand, and then a first reason for your stand, second reason for your stand, third reason for your stand, and then you give a counter argument and then you attack 
That means you refute it and then you can give another point for counter argument and then you refute it. And finally, you tend to repeat the overall idea and then you give your stand once again. So this is definitely an effective layout for argumentative composition. So this is an example of argumentative composition. OK, so it's about school uniforms. I'm pretty sure that we have done this before in the class. So I'm not going to read this once again. OK. And then I am going to continue with the last uh, topic uh, tested in, in composition. Paper one is narrative writing. So when it comes to narrative writing, we are looking at how complex, how sophisticated uh, your plot is going to be, and then the possible tenses, and then whether you have any specific uh, devices such as a flashback or even foreshadowing. So remember to uh, be very consistent with the tense. If you, I always suggest students to use past tense, okay? Now you should know that um, always decide how you're going to end your story even before you start it. Don't try too much. Like, um, like it's just going to be a 500 words of essay. Therefore, you can have about two to three uh, characters and then don't make it too complex. You can try to include flashback. Okay, something that the examiners love to see in your writing. You can use dialogues, but make sure that if you use dialogues, punctuate the dialogues accurately, and then um, make your, um, you know, the word tense that you use, that means the word action words that you use uh, in writing the dialogue be more specific. Like instead of you saying he said or she say, perhaps you can just put that um, she questioned um, uh, curiously, for an example. So express the emotions of the uh, of the characters through dialogue, okay? So make sure that you have to tell your story descriptively, don't have plain language, okay? Make sure that incorporate um, vivid description, figurative language, make us, uh, make us imagine, make us, um, you know, uh, make us be part of the story. OK, so you have to choose whether you want to take a first person point of view or the third person point of view. So you should know the advantages and disadvantages of these two types of um, uh, uh, voice. OK, and then um, make sure that you don't die at the end of the story if you're writing it from the first person point of view. OK, so. Um, and some expressions like, and then I woke up in a hospital, it was all a dream. These are common, um, uh, or I would say, um, a, a, not a very good effective way of ending your story. So please do not include this, okay? Now use plenty of interesting details and do not include too much of goriness. That means uh, like too much of blood, too much of killing in the story will make your story very ridiculous and, and not very, um, you know, believable. So always remember that um, if you're writing something related to fear, it's more believable when it is mental rather than physical. OK, so you can obviously adapt, uh, you can adapt a storyline from the books that you have read before from a movie, but you're not supposed to plagiarize the entire plot, especially when your examiner know from where you have taken it, then you are definitely in trouble. OK, so this is some features of narrative writing. I've done this with you guys, but I'm just going to go through this once again. OK, so point of view, yeah, first person point of view and third person point of view. I always prefer third person point of view because it allows me to give more um, expression about every single character in the story. OK, so um, I can even kill anyone in the story okay, because I'm just being the narrator of the story. And um, setting is something that I would uh, always suggest students to put in case if they do not know how to start a story, they can always start with the setting. And um, they can obviously follow this uh, key ideas. That means they can fill in the information about uh, where, when, uh, what sort of weather, what sort of social condition, the landscape environment, or whether there's any specific details related to the setting in order to come up with an effective way of starting a story, especially if the candidate is, uh, if the candidate prefers to start it with a setting. So you could see this is an example of introduction of a story using a setting. And then uh, you could see the information in the table. Uh, uh, the information in the table is basically taken from the, from the sample extract here. So uh, you may use this table and the details to write an effective setting. 
okay more examples of setting and the character that you um, create must be very effective too so it's not only about the name it's about the personality and how can you show the personality of the character perhaps you can show it through dialogues delivered by the by the character itself if i'm not if i'm not mistaken i did um, i did explain this in the class so i do not want to go in detail so i'm just like want to show you that the character is very crucial uh, in writing a story. So if you are writing dialogues, there are a few rules for you to consider. So these are some of the rules. Okay, we have discussed this, so you can take it as a sample um, guidance. So plot is another important element here. So, so this is how you start, and you can start with a character, introducing character, setting. Perhaps you can continue with the conflict, and then you can rise the action, and then you can write the climax, which is the turning point of the story, and then you have a falling action and the resolution. So if you see that, the story can appear to be slightly longer before the climax, and slightly shorter than uh, before. Why? Because once you have revealed something very important, um, I mean, once you have already done with the Dale nail biting moment of the story, therefore you should not drag the story anymore. Perhaps you have to focus on the aftermath of the result and then you have to come up with an interesting resolution or uh, the story ending. So this is an example of a story line with in fact a plot twist before the climax and this is the story which I shared with you in the class the other day okay so um, uh, perhaps I can just go through this very fast Errol, Arena and Nixley are wandering travelers and one day they stop by the village of Tricton and then there's a problem that their things went missing and then uh, they started looking for the thief and then they got some information about uh, the thief and then they got to know that um then they got to know that the thief was actually not someone who is uh, not not someone who was strong or brave perhaps it was a very timid girl and she did that to feed her family and then the climax is that they tried to find the thief and then uh, they found out that the the thief that means the girl the little girl ended up hurting herself with a stolen item so they tried to help the girl try to help the family and then this is some sort of moral value ending that uh, showing how important is um, neighborhood like um, you know how important that somebody should um, you know be more observant about uh, the neighborhood problems so yeah so this is an example of a very simple uh, plot using the plot development uh, sequence okay so this is another example which i shared with you in the class the other day and you have the slides with you and you can go through these okay and i did mention about the different types of story conflicts right that means we have person versus person that means if you are going uh, one character going against another character or um or a person versus nature or a person versus self that means when when a character going um, against a nature let's say how did how did the character survive a natural disaster like tsunami or how did the character basically um, entered the woods and then got attacked by a wild bear and then how did he survive so anything related to nature then person versus nature like if anyone is trying to come out from the inner conflict like fear self-doubt self-destructiveness therefore this is definitely person versus self and then you can even go against a particular society's belief okay or person versus supernatural if you're writing about alien um, um, invading the earth you're talking about um, something supernatural like you you've been um, stuck in a haunted house okay or something paranormal therefore this is person versus supernatural and if you're writing about time machine and then you're writing something related to technology science and this is obviously the last type of a story conflict okay so to understand this i have in fact included specific explanation for each uh, conflict okay you can uh, begin your stories uh, in a very interesting uh, manner you can start with sound some shocking statement you can start with something very descriptive you know and then you can even start with the question you can start with dialogue so these are some of the examples of uh, different beginnings and then these are some boring lists which you can convert into more engaging lit okay like for an example let me just read one here now i was excited for my birthday party so this is an action kind of uh, lead where 
whereby you are focusing on the action of the of the narrator of the character but perhaps this is not too effective so how can we make it more engaging here i threw on my favorite red dress and scrambled down the stairs as fast as i could it was my eighth birthday and i couldn't wait for the party to begin so can you see this so how can you make boring lit to more engaging lit you can obviously see here and then climax is very, very important. So climax is something that we try to relate to the conflict. So example, a character and her mother are upset with each other. The main character believes she must be an artist, whereas her mother does not support her career and would rather have her be an accountant. So this is some sort of character versus character, like character going against another character's belief. So the climax here, the character and her mother have a large argument in which they both state their feelings. At the end of the argument, they agree to love one another despite of their disagreement. So some sort of um, some sort of um, understanding um, to I mean some sort of um, in some sort of turning point of the story is happening here that you try to resolve the conflict at, uh, at the climax. So I have more examples given here. Perhaps you can look at some examples on how can you create interesting climax, okay? And also different types of ending, cliffhanger, twist in the tail, and then you have um, circular ending, surprise ending, um, or like a moral ending, moral lesson learned kind of ending, um, reflection, question, you can end it with something very funny with dialogue. So these are some examples of narrative ending. And uh, this is another important technique that uh, examiners would like to see uh, in students' response, which is the use of a flashback. So it's basically a scene set in time earlier than the present. And then definitely it's referring to the past. And then um, remember that this is an interruption which is needed uh, if it is going to be a very significant impact. If it is going to give a significant impact, then you can include flashback. So you should know why your story needs flashback and then um, you may need to look at some examples of flashback used in some uh, some writing in order to get little inspiration. Remember to understand the, the time frame of the flashback and then, um, you know, whether you are going to show differences in terms of the character during the flashback and now. And then you have to be very consistent with the tense. And then do you need to know how to cut away to your flashback scene? And then remember whether your flashback focuses on single experience or event that supports your story. So this, I would say, examples of a foreshadowing now. That means uh, some hint given in the story about the prediction of this of uh, of the of the writing. Okay, more. So this is some examples of flashback used in literature. So if you have free time, please go through all this. You have the slides. Okay, and then this is an example of um, this is an an example of narrative writing, an excellently written narrative writing. So if you have a free time, please go through this narrative writing. Okay, and uh, that's all for IGCSE seminar 2021-1123 uh, um, English language paper uh, one. So I will be doing another uh, seminar uh, focusing on paper two. Okay, so thank you very much and I wish you all the best for your upcoming examination.